Today is the 3rd of June 2019. Welcome to Walking the Way. My name is Ray. I want to say thank you to everyone for listening in as we continue to explore what it means to have a regular rhythm of worship. Sun is shining here in West Yorkshire. We've had some rain overnight, a bit of a cool feel to the air. I hope wherever you are, you're having the start of a lovely day. But if you're joining us for the first time, let me explain that each episode follows a really simple pattern of prayer, scripture, and music. So, having explained how it all works, let's start today's leg of walking the way with our opening prayer. Let's pray, shall we? O Holy God, like Isaiah the prophet, we stand in awe of your glory, feeling tremendously small and polluted by our sin and the sin of our society. Even so, you touch us with your burning presence, so we are made clean and whole. O God, our Creator, continue to build this household of faith into what you want us to be, O Christ. You are our Saviour. Lead us to do as you will. O Spirit, our power, strengthen us for the work of the Kingdom, a worship and service which is ours today as well as tomorrow. Blessed Trinity, fill this place and everybody who listens with your presence. For yours is the power the salvation, and the creation, now and always. Amen. We're going to have our first piece of music just to center our thoughts on God, and then we're going to get into our Bible readings for today. And in today's Bible readings, we continue to read about the life of Gideon, and we also continue on with Paul's letter to the Romans. But we'll see you on the other side. Let's ask God to speak to us through the word this morning. Loving God, we see in the life of Gideon a life of fear and courage, a life of promise and promises kept. So, Father, as we face a new week, I ask that we use the courage of Gideon as an example, knowing that you are the eternal God who forever keeps his promises. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible readings this week are taken from the New International Version. We're beginning with Judges 7. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them, in the valley near the hill of Moreh. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. Now my strength has saved me. So announced to the army, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out there for you. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water, 
There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps the water, from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the three hundred who took over the provisions and the trumpets of others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that day the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura, and listen to what they are saying. Afterwards you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outskirts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. The camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, That can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the three hundred men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands, and holding in their right hands the trumpet they were to blow, they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the three hundred trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with the swords. The army fled to Beshita, towards Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mehalah, near Tabith. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh were called out, and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they seized the water of the Jordan as far as beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like that? Why didn't you call us when you wanted to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. But he answered them, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Ebezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this the resentment against them subsided. Gideon and his three hundred men, exhausted, yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the men of Succoth, Give my troops some bread, they are worn out, and I am still pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Omidian. But the officials of Sokoth said, Do you already have the hands of Zuba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your troops? Then Gideon replied, Just for that. When the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hands, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. From there he went up to Peniel and made the same request, but they answered as the men of Sokoth had. So he said to the men of Peniel, When I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor, with a force of about 15,000 men, all that was left of the armies of the eastern people. 
a hundred and twenty thousand swordsmen had fallen. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Noba and Gogbaha, and attacked the unsuspecting army. Zeba and Zulmana, the two kings of Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Heres. He caught a young man of Sokoth and questioned him, and the young man wrote down for him the names of the seventy-seven elders of Sokoth, the elders of the town. Then Gideon came and said to the man of Sokoth, Here is Zeba and Zalmunna about whom you taunted me by saying, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sokoth a lesson by punishing them with dead thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Then he asked Zeba and Zalmunna, What kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, Those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, Kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. Zeba and Zalmunna said, Come, do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them, and took the ornaments off their camels' necks. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was a custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, We'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to seventeen hundred shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophra, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshipping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites, and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for forty years. Jeroboam, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had seventy sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine who lived in Shechem also bore him a son whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophra of the Abiezrites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Bereth as their god but did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. Romans 4 What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David said the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it not after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to them. 
and he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Proverbs 18 An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends, and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. When wickedness comes, so does contempt, and with shame comes reproach. The words of the mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a rushing stream. It is not good to be partial to the wicked, and so deprive the innocent of justice. The lips of fools bring them strife, and their mouths invite a beating. The mouths of fools are their undoing, and their lips are a snare to their very lives. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels, they go down to the inmost parts. One who is slack in his work is a brother to one who destroys. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower, the righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified tower, they imagine it a wall too high to scale. Before a downfall the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honour. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. The human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. A gift opens the way, and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. Casting the lot settles disputes and keeps strong opponents apart. A brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. From the fruit of their mouths a person's stomach is filled. With the harvest of their lips they are satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favour from the Lord. The poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer harshly. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And we're going to have our second piece of music just to give us some time to think about the bits of scripture that may have just caught our attention. And after the music, we'll say our prayers for the day and the time of the year.
Before we say our prayers for the day or the time of the year, just a reminder that if you'd, if you'd like us to pray with you, then drop us a line through the usual channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, email, and check the show notes for all the contact details. There are links to the majority of contact details through the, um, through the show notes. And this morning, if we can remember Christina, who discovered yesterday, who let us know yesterday, rather, that her four-year-old nephew has had a cancer diagnosis. So if we can remember Christina and her family. Let's pray, shall we? Father, you are the glorious morning. You are a refreshment of peace. You are the sounds as the dawn breaks. You are the rose that smells sweet. You are the Lord, my Creator. You are the wonder of life. You are the great words of wisdom. I read them and fill up in sight. You are the wonderful sunrise. You are a store of hope. You are the air that we breathe now. You are the warm winter coat. You are the Lord, my Creator. You are love without end. You are all grace and forgiveness. I stand loved and free as your friend. And our prayer for the time of the year. In your time, saving God, you walked upon this earth and in your time became one of us to show what we could become. Remind us always, as we look at our lives in comparison with yours, that at the center of things is the saving grace of God. In your time, mighty God, you will come in glory and in your time gather the harvest from one end of the earth to the other. Remind us always, in times of plenty and in times of famine, that at the center of all things are the mercy and justice of God. Amen. And we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.